Welcome to Being the Genuine Athlete podcast, where we inspire those who aim for excellence in life and want to understand the how and what it takes to be a champion in life. My name is Jura Koschak. My purpose, dedication and commitment is to activate your potential, that you understand the ego through your sport and life situations. So I share and give you the tools to be just this, the genuine athlete. Are you ready to tune in? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet High you too. High five, fist bump, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, dear listeners. I have a wonderful guest with me, Michael Huber. Hey, Jere, how are you? Nice to have you with us. I'm great. Uh, that's what I want to give, uh, transmit in our shows, uh, the Being the Genuine Athlete podcast, being genuine, being good, and of course, having guests like you are. Well, thank you for having me. This is uh, it's great to be here. Yes, I would like to uh, mention some of the things that I've uh, skimmed through your page that I'm also going to share uh, in the description of the podcast. You are a certified mental performance consultant. Correct. That is yeah. a, that is a um, a uh, credit that is um, granted by the Association for Applied Sports Psychology in the U.S. So I don't know the exact number, but I'd say it's around a thousand people here in the U.S. have the certification. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my formal my formal title. Well, I'm honored that you're here, uh, and I, I also I'm honored that you're a person, a genuine person that I like to share and express the stories, experiences with. Um, you're also a master of art something in sports that region, psychology, sports yes. psychology, which is actually art that we're going to touch <laughs> on this team. Uh, and <laughs> I invite all science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Science, art. And I'm inviting all the listeners and viewers of this podcast that really you let go and you get everything that you can get out all the nuggets, um, because I, I'm very sure that it's going to be uh, an amazing show. So regarding your purpose, please, I don't want to read it. Please, you express sure. what your purpose, your service to contribute in life is. Absolutely. I mean, my simply put, my purpose is to help young people be their best and perform at the level of their potential. And I believe that doing that uh, requires a awareness of self and it requires a development of certain mental and emotional skills that accompany the physical. And so my job is to help athletes, particularly young people with those skills so that they can overcome adversity and rise to the levels that they're actually, their bodies are actually capable of. Yeah, that's all nice and sad. But the reality, <laughs> we know where it is. It's not as uh, optimal. Uh, we all strive for the results, mm -hmm. But we forget that uh, results are a consequence of work on all levels. And that is why yes. we have people like you or me being a mental energy, a wholesome coach mm -hmm. and consultant guide, guidance because it's necessary. We are very focused, limited version of society, as I see. Uh, tell me how you have... Um, uh, still in the intro part of you, how have you come to this where you are now and why? Uh, what have you gone through? Because you have a very special um, like sure. push that, that you fell into. Yeah, so so sports psychology uh, is my second career. I, I spent about 20 years uh, or a little bit less in business working at a, you know, a corporate type job. And in my early 40s, say five for five, six years ago, I started to question that, that existence. And I, you know, I always wanted to work in sports. I was heavily into sports as a young person, uh, playing, um, being a fan of sports. And I always wanted to have a career, but I, you know, at the time I really didn't have the resources or the knowledge to put myself in a position to, to, to do that. And when I got a little bit older and I started to realize I wasn't happy with what I was doing, um, I, I just, you know, I had some personal experiences, you know, in my life, some challenges that, you know, I started to work on myself emotionally and mentally. And I did that with the help of a variety of different people, you know, a therapist, coaches, et cetera. And um, it just made me realize that helping people to sort of get to where they want to go was 
what I wanted to do because I was inspired by the people that helped me. And then I put the two together and I landed on uh, sports psychology. So that was, you know, like I said, about five years ago. And uh, I've been practicing for about two and a half years now. And uh, the vast majority of my work is with young people, you know, young athletes in the U.S. right now. Amazing. Yeah. Um, but you also had a trauma or something that uh, inspired you to break through or to come out of. Sure. What yeah. So I, 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 I had a, you know, I had a, a pretty severe uh, gambling addiction that um, came to a, a conclusion in uh, 10, 10 years ago this month, October of 2012. And, you know, through that process is really what kind of brought me to an awareness of, Hey, like you want, I wanted to do things differently in my life. And it took a few years to just sort of get my, um, my bearings, you know, just sort of get it back to a normal way of life and not living in, in an addictive, you know, world. And, um, after that first three or four years, I started to really think about like, how can I start to give back and share some of the experiences that I have uh, with others, uh, and do that in a productive way to, you know, to give back to, to society rather than, you know, just being so focused on myself, which is, which is what I was for so long. Yeah. So this is your hero's journey that's <laughs> so, impacting now lives of others. I, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Well, you are on the being the genuine athlete <laughs> podcast, so you must be on that direction, I, living it, yeah. and contributing. I think so. I think I am. And I, I, I really, truly, you know, love what I do. And I think I tie this a lot in the work. I tie this in the work I do with young athletes, which is to say, and I think you may have even referenced it early on, you know, I do it not for the results. I do it for the purpose. Right. And if, if I'm doing things for the purpose and I'm putting in the right actions and I'm dedicated to my work, the results will come, but it, they're not guaranteed, right? So if I'm doing it just for results, meaning, you know, money and recognition and all those things, if that's the only reason I'm doing my work, then I'm I'm only going to be disappointed and I'm going to lose my motivation. So my motivation comes from, you know, this is why what I love to do and I'm going to do, do it to the best of my ability and, um, and not look for, you know, outside validation as much as I I can, because otherwise I'm just going to be disappointed. And, you know, I think so far, you know, two and a half years is not, not a tremendous amount of time, but, um, I put in a lot of effort to try to, to really, you know, make this a big part of my, a big part of my life. Yeah. And this is the, the purpose is a lot of times, all of the time, actually, uh, built and, and, uh, from trauma and from some situations, yes. occasions that, uh, impact our lives that we allow that we mm -hmm. are misguided or mistreated or abused, or we abuse ourselves and lose the, the, mm -hmm. the right connection. Either it is to God, to universe, to love, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. any aspect of, of life on this level, uh, the spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it in myself as well, how, um, lost I was as a teenager uh, because of lack of information and trying to confirm, trying to uh, show myself as a valuable person in the family, in society, mm -hmm. through sport results. And the biggest issue and the suffering that I experienced, literal suffering, my mental, I, I didn't have a bad life. I didn't have, I wasn't mistreated. I wasn't abused or anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that trauma, but I created it. I abused myself with too much training, with too much working, because I was so yearning like a hamster on that wheel, looking for those results, as that result is going to give me the redemption, the, the win is going to give me, the medal is going to give me that happiness, that contribution, that confirmation and everything. And this is where we can touch the next uh, team uh, regarding parents, first parents and then we go deeper to, to children and, and at young athletes um, where I was suffering the most was not acknowledging that it is through pain, through acknowledging, accepting pain and uh, dialing in and having the right amount of pain, not going over pain. There is no, no pain, no gain. It's not like that, but because you don't want to destroy yourself with us that later, but I didn't realize that, in losing, there's a big 
uh, fundamental, you know, uh, potential built in, 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 in having some pain the right way, in mm -hmm. um, addressing pain, either it is physical, mental, emotional, the right way. Uh, because I see how parents and young athletes after we'll talk about them, how parents just lose focus and they have this optimum uh, image in their head that their kids are just going to be winners, are just going to have amazing situations, amazing coaches, amazing experience in their life. Mm -hmm. And if they lose, they, they deny it. A lot of denial, a lot of coping mechanisms. All of this shit, excuse me the expression, but this is producing a lot of suffering on the other side because yes. uh, uh, I'll just continue to wrap uh, to wrap it before I forget. Because if we all have one nervous system, and if we block our nervous system in denial of pain or certain, you know, not so uh, comfortable uh, emotions mm -hmm. that happen, we block them. Then, of course, we try to have more pleasure. Either it's through gambling, Netflix, social media, pornography, shopping, right. food. Distractions. Or, yeah, because you want to put uh, fill that hole that you Void. blocked yourself from. But if you live fully, wholesomely, you accept losing, you accept the process, you accept the knowledge. And this is why I'm also, is this my purpose? If I was suffering, they, they don't need to suffer. They just need to understand how to go through pain with pain. So maybe please first touch the parents' side uh, regarding this issue, how you work with families. Yeah. So I, I think what I see with families, and I'm, I'm a parent myself, so I, I experience some of it of my uh, myself. And so to be fair to parents and, and being able to put myself in a parent's shoes because I am one, I think a lot of it has to do with control, right? And I think we, we want the best for our children. Um, and that means a lot of times we think we know what's best for them, even though we're not the ones going through the process. Like I have to remind myself as a parent, like I think it looks easy when I'm watching my son or daughter play soccer, but I, I have to realize that it's really, really hard to make decisions and, and execute, you know, difficult things with under pressure in, in a very short amount of time and that they do the best they can. They don't want to fail and, and failure is just like pain is just information, right? I think you made the reference. You can learn from every mistake if you choose to learn from it. And I think parents, you know, they want the control. They want to make sure that their, their kids are doing, you know, the best they can. I also think there's a subconscious, um, I think there's a subconscious message, message that gets transferred back and forth between parents and kids about money, right? I don't think parents are outwardly telling their children like, hey, I'm investing a lot of money in this process. Nobody wants their kid to feel like, Oh, like they have to deliver results. But I think from what I, what I can see with the young people I work with, I think they feel it and they feel this need to sort of give back to the parents. Like, Hey, they're putting so much into this. Hey, I need to, I need to produce results or else I'm going to disappoint them. And I think that lack of understanding between the, the communication that tends to be a big problem, right? Parents and, 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 and young athletes, young people don't really communicate very well. And parents, rather than asking and trying to guide and giving the child the, the space to solve their own problems, they want to solve the problems for the, the child because that gives them control. It makes them feel better. But the, the, the child is saying like, Hey, I want to do this on my own. Like, I don't want to feel like I'm being pressured. So this this whole family dynamic that often leads to a lot of discomfort in the sports space, a lot of perfectionism and a lot of just, you know, like anger, you know, about this, this thing that's supposed to be really, really fun and supposed to teach us life lessons. It becomes a job for a lot of young people before it ever yields any sort of income. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you elaborate as well on the aspect of all these kids, young youth athletes are need to be mature before, much before they are able, their bodies are able physically to withstand emotional maturity. They need to already, because in tennis, I've heard the data that an, a, a tennis player needs to make in a match that lasts maybe an hour, more than 3000 decisions, choices, 
in football, maybe it's thousand, but it's a lot. A lot. A normal human being per day does five hundred. Yeah. And it's a and, lot. And and they're doing it under duress. They're being watched by mostly adults. They're playing for matches of consequence, right? Win, winning and losing. And they're trying to execute a really difficult physical skill, right? So any sport, especially fast moving sports like soccer and, and basketball and, and, and tennis. And like, there's so many choices that have to be made under this like pressure and speed. And I don't think that the people, even coaches, the ones who are coaching don't really appreciate what they're expecting of their players. Right. And as a coach, you know, you got to look, I would, I would say, look at the player and say like, I'm in awe of you. Like, this is hard. I know it's hard and you're doing it, you know, and it's not going to be easy and you're going to make mistakes. And I think a lot of times that the the coaches are also like very, very negative. And you, especially with young athletes, they need to be nurtured. They needed to be treated a certain way so that we continue to have them participate. And I think what's happening is, is that they're being treated like professionals at a very young age unfairly and that's where you're seeing a lot of kids drop out of sport now because it's so serious and it's so pressure filled. And why am I going to do this? If it's not fun, I could just sit home and play video games where no one tells me anything to do. Right. They don't tell me what to do. And, and I'm happy because I'm, I have my own autonomy. So it's, it's very complex. I think it kind of comes down to the adults having more respect for young people and treating them as people and not someone who could be sort of told what to do. Because I think that leads to a lot of the breakdowns that we see. Mm -hmm. And I see that um, it's difficult to acknowledge like a parent for a parent to accept. Like, for instance, an example, when you're sick, a lot of times it's not like that you are accepting and acknowledging unless, unless it's some cold flu or something because you're done with it. But like being sick in a cancer like uh, disease or something. Mm -hmm it usually goes very far before you really accept and go to do the exam, especially male side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this sport athletics is male version competition, male world. So I see this in parents, how difficult it is for them to acknowledge that they are blind, that they are mis upbringing their children, that they actually do harm, that children pr are, are driven to hate their parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that they are in the sport that they that they fuel themselves with hate. I see that a lot uh, because they have all this, not anger, they have rage. A lot of this is dealt mm -hmm. through and it's like an addiction of sport where they then discharge and detoxify certain emotions on in an unhealthy way. Additionally, like you mentioned with coaches, how do you see this? dishonesty not being sincere by parents because coaches usually say parents stay out of this uh, don't talk mm -hmm. to your kids leave them be live life their childhood they train here on the court in the in the field on the match don't don't step on it and they sit in the car they drive to home if it's 15 20 30 minutes and they go on them like a hammer not realizing that they are the ones not listening. They say to the coach, oh, no, no, not me. But then they lose it because they are so much involved, like you said, financially, emotionally, mm -hmm. and uh, business-wise with kids. Already they want them to be the brand uh, uh, representatives and I don't know what, with 13 years of age. So how do you see this, this honesty, this persistence and believing that you're doing good, like you mentioned, and actually you're not. This blind spot. That it's a lot of times in parents. I think it's the first and foremost, I think it's a lack of awareness, yeah. right? I, I think it, as a sports psychology professional who studies motivation in the space, you know, understanding youth motivation to participate, I think parents need to understand that because I think there's just this lack of understanding. And, and I was raised and coached this way growing up. Coaching to me meant. I'm going to tell you what to do because I'm the adult and you're the child, but that's not the best way to coach. a young. If person. I step in here, this is the abuse of the position because you are an adult and you think that you have the right as an authority, but this Correct. is not with knowledge. 
with uh, respect. This is with abuse of power. It's a lack of understanding. Yes. And the power is being abused. And I don't know that it's being abused purposely. Again, I yeah. don't think coaches and parents understand if, if there's a lot of research on this topic and I've, I've read a lot of it. And if parents and coaches understood what truly motivated young athletes, that's the starting place to start to, for them to start to behave differently. If I'm a young athlete and this is, this goes for anybody who does anything at any age, I want to feel like I'm in control of my experience. I want to feel like I'm getting better. I'm competent. And I want to be, I want to be doing this thing, this sport with somebody I really enjoy. Right. I want to be connected to the people I'm with. If those three boxes are checked, I have control over my situation. I feel like I'm getting better and I'm with people I enjoy being with. I want to keep doing it. And I think parents don't really understand that. Or if they, they're not willing to give up the, the control part of it, right? They don't, they won't let just let their kids go make their own decisions or they won't rely on their kids to solve their own problems. They're going to tell them what to do. And right there, you're cutting off the autonomy piece of it. So motivation is really affected by that. If kids feel like they have no say in their experience or they're being told what to do, they're going to, they're going to shut down. So I think parents need to understand that. And then you have the awareness. I think there's a mindfulness element to it, right? Like you're riding, you, you're, you alluded to it. You're riding home in the car and, and, and listen, I'm guilty of this as much as the next parent. I know better and, and I don't do it a lot, but every once in a while you, you want to say something, right? You want to say, get it off your mind or you didn't like what happened. And you're just thinking, oh, I need to tell you now. And the emotion and the, and the feeling is still fresh for them. And so if I question them or I challenge them on something that's really still raw, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to push back, right. Or they're going to shut down either way. They're not going to want to talk to me as a parent about anything. And no matter what I say, even if it makes sense, they're going to ignore me because they're going to be like, you're not doing it. And I don't want to hear it. And I don't want to talk to you. And, and then like, you're angry because you know that yeah. you're saying right, but you don't get the feedback that you want and need. Right. Well, and, and if we talk about going back to the idea of putting the person first, like it, the, my, my opinion, right. This is not based in research or, or, or evidence, but my opinion is, is when a parent criticizes a kid about their sports performance, what they hear is I, that you don't love me, right? Because now there's a condition placed on like, I, all I wanted to do is play and have a good time and, and, and be happy and make you happy. And now you're criticizing me for what I did on the field. Like, what does that matter? Like, why can't you just love me either way? And, and that's not what parents intend to do at all, right? But that's the way I think it's received. And parents don't really realize that's happening. So it becomes a very toxic, it very, becomes a very toxic situation at times. Yeah, you've hit the spot on it with this. And this is happening a lot, this lack of awareness. And it's actually, I want to like maybe uh, wrap up this parent uh, team. What happens when you deliver, when you contribute and these families, these parents like soak you and accept the knowledge, your guidance, what happens? What kind of transformation, conversion do you see in them according uh, in regards to their kids, their youth, uh, young athletes? Well, uh, let me say first, say first, uh, first thing this I will say is that I think a lot of the families that choose to work with me are at the high end of the curve in terms of having the understanding because they're not, they're open to help because they know it's a really hard job. Right. And you would Whereas, want that low curve, right? <laughs> that's right. why you're needed. Right. But, but that, but that's why we have things like podcasts and, yeah. you know, websites and articles Slowly. because, right. They, because if, if somebody wants to be different and they want to make a change, they're going to do it at their own pace. And yeah. like somebody like me could be very threatening to a parent because the parents like, well, I don't need you. Like I'm the parent. Like I don't need someone else to tell me with help my kid. At the same time, I think, I think what the families that I work with realize is that there's room for other people to help, right? There's a, there's, there's room for it to be a community. It's not all of the responsibility is on them. And I think a lot of parents also realize that, especially with, with athletes 
Like I have one athlete that I work with is high, in high school, a male baseball player. And the, the family came to me, not because of performance. They came to me because of attitude. The way that he was reacting to failure was affecting the whole family. And because I'm able to talk with the young person, the, my client, in a confidential way and give him strategies to deal with that, he's much more likely to try those. And what they've seen is they've seen improvement. And so they're very happy that they're seeing their son happy or more able to cope with adversity than he was. And I think sometimes parents, sometimes the, just throw our hands up and we'll say like, Hey, I can't, I can't do it anymore. And I, I love to be that person. Like I, I can't do it for my own kids most of the time because I'm their father, even though they know I'm in sports psychology, they know that I'm smart and I know I respect them and all, all these things. It's still not the same. They don't want to hear it from me. They want to, they want me to hug them and tell them I love them. They don't want to hear critiques about sport because that's only a part of who they are. That's only part of their identity. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's again, hit on the spot. Uh, let's go towards the youth, towards the kids, the children that uh, are lost, confused, are, are in their own small world, uh, not being ready or, or yet to, 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 um, to go with this adversity, to cope with it, to not being prepared at all. I was like that playing table tennis since I was eight years old being in a national selection when I was 13, 14. And in between before I trained like six, seven, eight times per week, Monday to Friday, I trained double times and school when I was 12 years of age. It's a lot. And I had a breakdown when I was 15 years of age. And I did yoga when I was 15 years of age, like the first one doing yoga in the 90s, you know, <laughs> like an athlete somewhere. Um, so in that case, I, I lacked the the love from my parents because they didn't know how to cope with it what i brought home all the stress or the pressure that i put on myself the coach yes. wasn't able psychologically he wasn't you know educated in that way he just knew the technique tactics and all about table tennis so i lacked in a lot of senses and when you lack you're in stress and i was in chronic mm -hmm. stress that i'm going i'm 40 now and i'm going out of chronic stress that i was in since i was a teenager beginning mm -hmm. teenager this chronic stress of not having information, being frozen in this situation or, or blocking them out or, you know, having those anger, rage mm -hmm. tantrums that I remember that everybody else remembers me by them because I just, you know, yes. I cope, I push down, push down and then I explode it. Explode, yeah. Some others were crying. Some others did something, harmed themselves, all of these things. And I also invested myself out of this trauma to deliver this knowledge. And I'm so grateful that you are in this direction as well, mm -hmm. developed and educated that you can share more uh, about this, how youth needs this knowledge and since when. Let's begin with this. When are you like, should this be a subject in school? Like when they are 10 years of age or maybe nine, regardless of being an athlete. Yes. So I think uh, uh, I have a lot to say. So I do think that in the United States, some of the fundamental concepts that we teach in sports psychology are being taught in schools like growth mindset and, and, and embracing failure and embracing development versus, you know, trying to be perfect. I think it does get taught. And it's interesting because when I got into, you know, the field, you know, I wasn't sure how young, you know, how young should my clients be? You know, because my bias is, is like, if you have a nine or a 10 year old, like, is it too early to be spending money on somebody like me? But I, I took on a couple of younger clients, one as young as nine. And what I do realize, I have realized is that the sooner you can have this type of intervention, whether it's on an individual basis or in groups, whether it's with teams or in classrooms or whatever, the earlier you, you start the better chance you have of giving somebody the resources to not get to that place of really, really acute perfectionism, which is what I see a lot of in the 16, 17, 18 year old range where 
the athlete has been so programmed to put all of their eggs into the basket of, I need to perform at the highest level all the time that when things don't go their way, they do, they explode. They, 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 they lose control of their emotions. Their thoughts become debilitating and it becomes a roller coaster. And then you can teach them at that point, but they have to be really open minded to trying a new way of approaching things. And they've been doing, they've been coping with the stress and adversity of, of, of athletics for probably this way for 10 to 12 years already. So now you've got 12 years of, of experiences and patterns that are really hard to break. So when I get involved with somebody like that, it takes a lot of patience and, and time to cut through the stuff that's been happening. And what I try to tell athletes is, is like, Hey, it's not going to change overnight. You've been practicing your sport for the last 10 to 12 years. You go, you know, six days a week, you know, pretty much all year round working on the physical and skill elements of your sport. And when I ask them how much mental work or training they've done, the answer is almost always zero, nothing. So you've got tens of thousands of hours invested in your sport and you've got zero mental training. So you don't have any idea really how to deal with this stuff in a productive way, but you believe that you should be the best one out there. It's, it's a really, um, it's the very, very volatile combination. Yeah. This is the biggest uh, trick that, that somebody plays on us as young athletes and on parents, the, the representation of psychology and mental mm -hmm. skills and, and uh, resources and tools uh, regarding emotions, regarding because sport is cruel. It brings out the worst and the best, but if you don't know, you don't know. And it's a lot of blind exactly. spots. And this is so toxic that kids, uh, I was among them, and I see a lot of them still now. Parents, like you mentioned before, they want to get involved because they need it and they invest and they do it. But they can't go back because then, yeah, well, then what, what will happen if I don't, you know, what talk? Will happen, what exactly. will happen? And kids are just like doing all the stuff that you said. They're like cooking without food, without any substance. <laughs> they're training. And then they're like, why didn't I win? Why does this happen to me? Yeah, well, it's like talking without words. It's like playing a violin without a violin or without notes. You cannot do it. And this is still, this still amazes me. We are end of 2022 and people are still like psychology, mental. Yes. No, it's like, how, how is this, this? Because this, I think this is such a hidden secret. It's like, I don't know what, where, who did this, but it's such a misguidance on this. Uh, and, and how do you break through these uh, blockages that parents and, and a lot of, lot of young athletes have maybe one excuse is, yeah, if I work with a psychologist, it means that I'm, that I'm weak or that I'm bad or that something's wrong with me or like these kind of excuses. What else did you encounter? Well, I, um, I do think that that exists. I do think that that stigma still is real. Um, I do think people are more open to it, but mm -hmm. they're very, they're very careful about letting other people know that they're doing it. And mm -hmm. so what I try to do is normalize it. You know, when I'm working with prof uh, you know, young athletes, I'll say like uh, most professional teams in the United States and, and now throughout the world in invest in sports psychology. So the professionals are doing it. So it's not like this is something that like you want your, you're, 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 you're participating in your sport a lot of times because you want to go to the highest level. Well, at the highest level, they're doing this. So if, the, if they're doing it at the highest level, then it's, it's probably good enough for you too. And I think that they understand that and they like it. The thing that I find is that the people that I work with will not talk about it outside of like with me, like they're not telling their friends, they're not recommending, Hey, you should try this. It's like, I'm going to do this and I don't want anybody to know because I don't want anybody to think we're crazy or my son or daughter's got a problem mentally or that I, I don't want them to judge me for spending money on, you know what I'm saying? Like it's a very, there's a sensitivity to knowing that people are doing this. And I definitely, that's something I definitely want to 
um, I always try to destigmatize, whether it's by being very open about my own situation, my own circumstances. So people understand, like I've gotten help too, right? I've talked to people and professionals and I've had anxiety. I've had depression. I've, you know, dealt with all these things and I ask for help and it's normal and it's okay. And if you can get past that, that stigma, that hurdle, it's going to help you be the best person you could be. Because now you're dealing with all these things. I think you've made reference to it a number of times. It's the acceptance, the acceptance that I'm human and that things are going to happen that I can't control. There are feelings and thoughts I'm going to have that are going to make me feel a certain way. And I need to be able to manage that and continue to move forward. If you don't have the tools to do that, it's just going to become an avalanche. It's going to just land on top of your head and it's going to crush you. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the time, People have to get to that point before they seek out help. They have to be suffocating before they go, I need someone to help me. Mm -hmm. But how good it is, right, Michael, when you when you get that help, when you go to the pro through the process, with the process, in the process, when you begin to listen to yourself, mm -hmm. your body, your emotions, when you begin to talk about them. Me, myself, as a professional athlete already at a young age, wanting to be the professional, the best one in the country and then in the Europe because I, I competed there. Mm -hmm. I read a book and I felt so good, not because I had the result, but because I got some light, some message, some information that made me think clearly, that connected the dots, that finally I was like, oh, this is how it works. Mm -hmm. I wasn't yes. in the blue. I wasn't in the dark. And it, I have goosebumps now because this is what amazes me when I watch mm -hmm. like Peaceful Warrior, the movie probably watched from Dan Millman. Mm -hmm. I watched it several times or any other movie like athlete movie written or made by True Story. I have goosebumps because I see how that actor or that person went through that curve, uh, that learning journey, curve right? and like transformation, the hero journey that finally you open and it feels so good. Mm -hmm. And then you go and compete or go on a training with this good feeling. Imagine that. So how, what's your experience yeah. with this? I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I think unfortunately I never, I never got to experience it as an athlete because I was, I was young and I never got to that place. So I think there are times that I have some regrets about the fact that I really wasn't like in, I didn't have a true understanding of myself as a person that I could go out and compete. But I bring it to my my work today. Like now that I am, I have that awareness and that command of myself and understand what I'm capable of. Now I bring it to helping other people. And I, I think you know I'll, I'll I'll share a story. I had a, a guest on my podcast um, who was a Olympic Olympic fencer, and he talks about a lot of the same things that you talk about. Had a very hard time controlling his emotions. He was, you know, when he would lose, he'd get very angry. He'd get very, you know, stressed. And he had a very, like, he had negative reactions. And it wasn't until he he got injured leading up to an Olympics and he wasn't sure he was going to compete. He went to go see a sports psychologist. And the sports psychologist helped him reframe his perspective about sports. And for him, at that point, it became a values-based exercise. Why am I competing? I'm competing for the love of it. I'm competing because I want to test myself and I, I want to be better. And I, all those things. And he went out and he performed as well as he ever had performed at the highest level because of the fact that he had a really clear understanding of himself and why he was doing it. And this is probably somebody who was like 30 years old at the time, right? But a lot of times if we can't get those blocks out of the way, we're never going to realize our potential because those voices in our head and those feelings that we don't know how to identify are going to eat away at our ability to actually go do something right to go execute the way our body knows how to execute. Um, have you ever read the book um, inner game of tennis? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that I talk about that a lot with any sport, right? There's the one self one and self two. You know, self one is your, your ego, your mind, mm -hmm. right? It's telling you all these things. And self two is your body, which knows how to do everything automatically because it's been doing it so long. 
but the mind is getting in the way and we don't know how to remove the mind so that the body can just do what it knows how to do naturally. And I think that that metaphor resonates a lot for athletes. Like, you know how to do this. You're an expert if you're 17 and you've been playing for 10 plus years. Your mind is the only thing that's holding you back. So how do we get command of that mind and move it out of the way so the body can do what it needs to do? And I think that that, it's not that easy, but it definitely helps for them to understand that picture of, okay, my mind's getting in the way. Now all these things we're working on are going to help me push it to the side so I could just go do my thing. Mm -hmm. And yet not being, not doing all of this that you mentioned now and still having that condition, it needs to give me the best result. It will be, the best result will be what will be in that yeah, way. That's right. Well, the results we don't control, right? Yeah. We always have somebody else on the other side of the net. We always have different, you know, people watching us on different venues mm -hmm. and with different weather. And there's all these things that we can't control. And so we can't control the outcomes. It, we All we control is us. And I think if people look at mastery of the self as success, then the results are actually going to be better. That's the irony of it, because I think if we try to control the results that we can't really control, we're just going to drive ourselves crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go to the next agenda and connect uh, connected with toxicity, or you already mentioned some of the toxic things like perfectionism, among others, and business. Uh, I've seen that business has completely transformed from something that an elite Uh, athletes, uh, professionals do, and the rest of the society loves and and uh, enjoys like uh, performing in the California beaches or whatever in the world, playing different sports and like enjoying in community. We have completely gone into this technology, this some idiocracy or something that we've invested ourselves with technology and all the social media. And we've allowed this business has like, has like taken over the love for and of sport. Business is in all of the pores of young youth athletes being age of eight or seven or nine, and they already are brand representatives. And parents, of course, push because they get something from it and they get the return on investment. So it's like the lower awareness that we have, the bigger lack of awareness that adults have, the more we allow that this business like minded agenda f filters and comes into the youth sport and takes over and brings many toxic things out. Uh, and it's just a mirror of who we are. So if we will raise the awareness of what we talk now and begin to implement all these things, then we can begin to also say no to certain business agendas that are completely embedded already in not in college only or university or then professional sport, but also in high school and lower areas. How do you cope with this or how have you seen this business toxic and other toxic things? I, I, I do think that the professionalization of sports at a young age has been really, really dangerous um, because we're treating, and I, again, I think you alluded to this before, we're treating 12 year olds like professionals, right? Whether it's the way they dress, their equipment, travel, um, exposure through media and social media. I think it puts a lot of pressure that's unnecessary. Uh, further, it also, I think, speaks to parents because parents like that there's this recognition of what they're investing into. It makes everybody feel like it's important. Um, but it's not, I don't think it's healthy now. Unfortunately, I think it's just the way the world is now. I think it's the culture, it's the institution. And I know that there are people out there and they're probably, you know, in the minority or their, their voices that are hard to kind of cut through the noise that, there were people who would definitely take it all, you know, do, you know, reverse it and go back to the way it was. But I don't think that's ever, that's ever going to happen. So I, for me, from where I sit, I think it's a matter of education, right? If we're going to live in this environment where young people are put under pressure sooner, they're being asked to do doing more physically, the amount of training that young athletes do now is insane. And they do it all year round. 
the lifting the weights, the nutritionist, the running, the everything, practicing all year round, playing tournaments all year round, depending on the sport. It's a lot. And it's a physical burnout and it's a mental burnout. And nobody is willing to stop. It's almost like nuclear disarmament, right? Like if there are two nuclear weapons pointed at each, you know, two countries pointing nuclear weapons at each other, no one's going to back off, right? Family's going, well, if my kid doesn't play baseball in the summer and the fall, well, they're going to fall behind. So we have to do it too, right? There's this mentality of we have to do it. And I think that if you educate people about the risks of that and educate people that that's actually going to do more harm than good in a lot of cases in the long run, then at least them gives them the framework to make better choices. I think there's so many people who just aren't aware or they just think it's the best way to do it because somebody else is doing it that way or telling them to do it that way. They don't know any better and they just do it. And then after the fact, they look back and go, that was a lot. Why was I doing that? Why, why was I having my kid you know, play all year around and traveling all over the place and spending all this money when we could have given them a break or we could have went on a family vacation or, you know, he could have done, or she could have done multiple sports, you know? And so I think, I think it's just a little bit more, you know, more education and awareness around, Hey, they're not professionals and you don't have to treat them like professionals. It's up to you. You have a choice and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need to, I don't like to use this word need, but we need to come out of this short term profit society, uh, looking into things and, and being guided into that direction. We need to be more in the long-term uh, consequences of the wholesome yes. person. Yes. And, and um, like, because then kids can enjoy, then the youth enjoys and has fun and yet still results will come, but this is now all like business minded profit uh, based. And yes. it has infiltrated not only from the pharmacy through the other pores and into sport as well, because, you know, kids needs five pair of shoes every year and it's a lot of business and that racket and that ball and that gloves and that dress. It's like on and on, on instant and on. profit, instant, the best. And kids wanted the best thing and then they compare. So not to be so negative, like pointing out because there's a lot of good things happening. And actually, I like the way the direction the society is going, because when something is so like destroyed it's gonna be burned down to the ground and something new will grow and i see that now it's such a hype it's so dense with all this noise of this instant results and this uh, version of sport a professional also with youth uh, that it's gonna turn around it's gonna flip the coin into this new era not like it was but something built in you and this is where we are going this is why we have this podcast and other things that uh, yeah. we educate and we show that it's possible and that will go what do you see kind of uh, this way of uh, positive look on things how you see that it's turning around regardless of all of this uh, business being like so inside and regardless of psychology still being something that's not so accepted how do you see that it's turning the point and in which direction it is turning well, I, I, I think, I think what I see is I do see a greater awareness at the grassroots level. I think, I think families understand that a lot of what they've been doing or being asked to do, I think they, they understand that it's excessive, right? They, I think they understand that it's too much. I think the biggest challenge is, and, and I think that a lot of that has to do with education. I think people are becoming more aware of the fact that more isn't always better and that making, you know, you know, youth sport into a business is not really healthy for anybody except for the people who make money off of it. Um, that being said, I think the area of improvement is, is making people feel comfortable that they can take ownership and make choices that are best for their family without feeling like they're going to get left behind because that's what I see. I think people feel like, Hey, if I, if I back off, then my child and all the money I spent and my child's going to get left behind and they're not going to get a scholarship. And, you know, we've spent all this money and there's no return. Right. I think it's okay. Like if you, if you're going into sports with the understanding that sports serves a purpose to develop life skills and develop healthy habits and living, and then that's the purpose and it's not to attain some outcome 
then then we're going to be okay because you know you know as well as i do you know better than i do as a, as a former professional the amount of effort and time and energy and money and everything that it takes to be, get to a professional level in any sport there's only this many people the smallest percentage of the population who ever gets there so it's delusional to think that you're going to get there you know unless you're like on the precipice of it and i think a lot of the people like just have these dreams of you know, athletic success that aren't realistic just based on statistics. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen this, like you mentioned now, the scholarship and college and universities and um, sort of sick um, chasing also of the coaches on the university of getting some contracts and being sponsored and, you know, the teams must win and division mm -hmm. one and everything and how they, uh, I had some um these college athletes that I were that for my clients and how they were pushed over the edge and over the limit and many suicides that happen in the USA and all around the world because of this agenda of achieving also in college sport, I see how this is delusional, like you mentioned, and detrimental because you're not, you don't live 20 years or 25 years and then you're done. You have a life to live and you need to get the most out of it. You can get the most out of it and learn and not destroy your body like the, until the age of 25 or 30. Why would you want your body to be destroyed? Having more of these athletes that are more uh, cognizant and more aware mm -hmm. of how to use their body and not deplete it and have this large depth of always mm -hmm. just abusing and wanting more from the body and not respecting it. Yeah. How do you see these? Because you prepare youth uh, athletes uh, to college to enter there. How do you see this transition being uh, used more that they are more wholesomely aware? I, I well, I I definitely think that young athletes are much. They are more aware of the health, the physical health elements, and I think they're much more aware about taking care of their body and eating right and sleeping and not drinking or doing things that are going to be harmful. I think there's a much greater level of awareness. And I think that that's indicative of society in general, you know? So I think in that respect, I think a lot of athletes are mindful of that. If they're hurt, you know, if they have an injury, that's not, that doesn't allow them to, to perform at a level high enough to be competent. They're not going to risk long-term injury. They're going to, they're going to speak up for themselves. If they have a concussion, you know, they're going to more bigger. They're more likely to speak up for themselves. I think that is turning, but I still think we have a culture in sports, particularly in America, where there's this feeling that you've always got to be doing more. And the way to get better is to do more. And that means taxing not only your physical well being, but your emotional well being, your mental well being, your relationships, all for sacrificing, you know, for the sacrifice of being a better performer. And I think that that's really dangerous. You know, it's really dangerous from an identity perspective. Cause like you said, when you hit 25 or 30 years old, or maybe even earlier, when you retire sports gone and you, a lot of athletes struggle with that transition because the only thing that mattered, the only way they define themselves was an athlete. I see this a lot with my young athletes. Like when they, when they look at their identity and you ask them to break it up into pieces, the vast majority of their identity, if you look at a pie chart, is athlete. Like everything they do is geared toward athletic success. And if they don't get the results or they're forced out to retire, that's going to lead to maybe depression or bad habits or ways to fill the void, like you said, because now sports gone and they never really had this balanced perspective about who they were as a person. And sports was a part of it and a big part of it, but it wasn't the only part of it. And I think that that's constantly has to be um, stressed with athletes. Like you're, be, you're more than just an athlete. And if you choose to make athletics, the this, this central part of your life, that's your choice. And I think that's okay. But you also have to understand the consequence of that. And what am I doing to make sure that I'm keeping myself healthy in the face of those choices so that when it ends or if I get hurt or things don't go my way, I'm capable of coping with the adversity that comes with it. And I think that's where the mental training piece really comes in is how do I look at myself as a person? How do I manage these things that I'm not planning for? Let's prepare for it. 
let's build a set of tools that you can use when things don't go your way or the results aren't that the way you want them to be so that you can be a balanced human being at the end of it. And I think that that's hard for a lot of athletes because they struggle with not being able to, to play their sport anymore. Yeah, the, the ego world, the yeah. subconscious survival uh, approach to life is very limited point of view. And a lot of athletes and people in general, non-athletes as well, mm -hmm. have this um, very limited agenda in their life. And it's easier, but the cost is huge. Like you mentioned, all of the diseases, detrimental anxiety, depression, suicides, it's uh, crazy mm -hmm. how this one-sided way of looking of just I'm an athlete and this what if you change the question? What if you change the perspective? It's difficult, but you, we have so much to learn to, yes. when we use the athletics as a platform to adjust to life, to, to learn, to get mm -hmm. the discipline, to get all of it that you can out of this training and yes. having fun and enjoying along Absolutely. the way in this way, uh, uh, being approaching to sport. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, to go back to the, the last question about, you know, the business side, I, I think that perspective gets lost earlier because sports has become a business. It's even at the youngest of ages, people are looking at winning and losing as being important. Why? Well, because the people who run these clubs, the private clubs want to promote their clubs by winning. They're not promoting their clubs based on values they're not, they're not basing it on character development, building life skills. People are going to these clubs because they're like, oh, we won such and such tournament or we've produced X number of college athletes or pro athletes. And so that's what the parents gravitate towards because those are tangible results. But when you, if I'm running a club and I say, hey, I'm going to make your, your child a better human being and teach them to learn with, to lose with dignity and deal with adversity and, you know, you know, build character. No, I want to win, you know, and I think that that's a big part of the problem because really at the youngest ages, it's about building character and life skills and having fun. And we don't promote that. We don't market that. We market wins and losses and pretty uniforms and travel to tournaments and all those things that don't matter when kids are six, seven, eight, nine years old. Yeah. You reminded me now of our friends, uh, tennis friends that have a club in the country where I come from, Slovenia. Uh, and they they practically advertise and promote themselves as uh, we care for your person, child, human being, and then maybe an athlete. We give them the values, and they thrive. They have, oh, of it. course, limited a limited uh, quantity of athletes, but what they have is kids enjoying playing. They have camps. They give them the wholesome approach, and that's uh, that's what I love about them as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's that's great. And I, I think there, you know, there needs to be more of that, you know, mm -hmm. and I listen as a sports psychology professional, you know, in a self-serving way, I do think that a lot of these clubs and a lot of the younger high, high school and young and, and, and youth travel sport clubs incorporating sports psychology in that environment at a young age is such a huge value, right? Like it's such a value add that a lot of clubs just don't think about. They have trainers like soccer trainers and baseball trainers, and they have coaches who played the sport, but they're not really trained to be coaches. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. just because you know how to play the sport doesn't make you a good coach. I think that's a big issue in the U S in the U S because we don't have a central, you know, national governing body, like a lot of European countries do in other countries. We don't have a coach certification program. Our coaches don't have to be certified in many sports. They don't have to go through training. They can just show up and be coaches. And because they know how to play the game and they play the game, but they don't know how to talk to young people. They don't know how to motivate young people. They don't know how to communicate. They yell and they scream. And like, that's a problem, right? There's room for better coaching. And that requires resources and education. And I think there's not a lot of appetite for it if it means that we have to spend money on it. You know, I think they'd rather have a bigger profit, you know, than have a higher cost of coaches, but having really good coaches who care for the athlete and know how to truly coach a person versus coaching a game, which are two different things. Mm -hmm. 
um, to wrap it up, what are your certain instructions, golden nuggets, steps that you already mentioned, maybe education, communication, building up awareness, being more present for parents, for youth, for kids? Yeah, I think I think for a parent, you know, if it's a parent listening, I think the first thing I always suggest when I get the question is ask more questions, you know, ask more questions and listen more and stop. Don't use as many statements or commands or instructions, because I think if you give a voice to your young athlete and allow them to sort of express their perspective on why they do what they do and why things go the way they go. And they feel like they have the room to do that. I think you've created a much healthier relationship in the sport context, which is going to lead to even more development. So I think that's probably the first thing I would say to a parent. Um, I think the second thing I would say is like, listen, I think parents need to, to practice what they preach. And so what do I mean by that? A lot of times parents will come to me and ask me to help a child with their mindset, their mental skills, whatever you want to call it, but they're not working on that themselves. Right. And so the parent needs to be in control of their emotions. They need to be mindful. They need to be able to take deep breaths when, you know, when things are spinning out of control, they need to have a mental game plan too, because it is stressful. To be fair, right? When your child is competing, you're invested in it emotionally. You want your child to succeed. And if you're not prepared emotionally and mentally to deal with the ups and downs, you're just going to pass that on. Like I think you said this earlier, you're going to pass this on and model a really poor behavior for your child. And your child's going to look at it and go, well, you want me to act differently, but you're not acting differently. And then there's a hypocrisy in it. So I think parents need to do the work as well you know, just as much as the kids do. Yeah. Um, to an athlete, I would say you're more than an athlete. You know, I think that that's become pretty, a pretty common thing to say, but I really do believe it. Right. Like sport is important. Perfectionism helps athletes, right? It can be very helpful, productive, but to the point where, it, you know, your perfectionism rules you because all you care about is the level at which you perform as an athlete. It's going to, it's going to overwhelm you right? You need to use the perfectionism adaptively in the situations where you're trying to get better at something and you got to take, take your you know foot off the pedal as it relates to results, knowing that those results are out of your control and they don't define who you are as a person, right? A bad day, a bad match, a bad season even doesn't define who you are as a person. You're still a good person. You just had a hard time, right? And so I think that that's that's important for, for young athletes to understand. Great. I will add resting. We didn't touch this subject, but resting, it's not watching, Absolutely. watching Netflix or anything. Maybe it's reading book. Maybe it's meditating. Maybe it's visualizing, but resting, which also parents uh, are not so keen on maybe because it's always do more. Go, get go, more, go, 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 go. Yes. Yeah. And maybe as well. Yeah. Like you mentioned, the tools, the resources, there's a lot of things available uh, on listening to yourself and, and really being more in tune. So I'll add a, 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 an anecdote to that. So uh, with a lot of my athletes, particularly the ones who are a bit older, I asked them to try meditation. And I think there's a lot of discomfort at first because they're not used to sitting still and closing their eyes and being with their thoughts. I think a lot of times it's very, very threatening to sit there and just like all of a sudden, like be aware of the fact that there's a, zillion thoughts running through your head but what, what i usually hear from them is it's nice to be able to close my eyes and not look at my phone for five minutes that's all i ask right five minutes it's nice i can relax and they start to realize that things slow down a little bit when you start to practice being aware and i do think that that five minutes like just the five minutes for my athletes can make a really huge difference. I agree with you, right? Like there's a constant go, go, go mentality. And there's also constant stimulation, phone, TV, whatever it is. They're not, there's not that time to decompress and reflect, right? Having a, keeping a journal, right? How was my day? Was I productive? What could I have done differently? 
writing, maybe doing a little reading, like you said, reading a passage or something that's going to con connect you to something spiritual, right? That's not a huge investment of time. Like if you do those three things, if you journal, meditate, and, you know, maybe you do some breathing exercises or, you know, read a passage, it's like 10 to 15 minutes. Like that little bit of 10 to 15 minutes every day adds up to somebody who's going to be much more in tune with themselves. And especially when the time comes where things are stressful, you're able to slow things down, you know, because if you try to throw slow things down under stress when you're competing and you're not practicing, you're doomed. Thank you, Michael. You've hit all the nails on Thank the right you. spot. You've done a good job. Thank uh, you. I'm sure you didn't like aim like, uh, but you've done your <laughs> job. You've developed yourself. So thank you very much for being and, and sharing with me. the listeners. Thank you. It's been a privilege. Thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in. Follow me on being the genuine athlete, Instagram and Facebook page. Share, like and comment and be genuine all the way.